So I want to get straight into it. Uh, my name's Emma. Hello, everybody. If you've not met me before, I'm a learning specialist at Empower Development. Um, we are a training company uh, working across the insurance market. Um, we do CII training. We've got a CII revision platform. Um, and we also do other aspects of technical training and training courses um, across the whole of the insurance market. Um, and today we are looking at AF1, what you need to know. So as always, the book is really important. Please pop in the chat if you have booked your exam. Um, that's good to know as well. Um, what date you've booked that for, or if you've not booked it yet, um, what date are you thinking? Um, I'll try and pick up on all of the main aspects of the book, maybe give you some sort of tips and tricks to how to remember things um, and point out any key areas where you might see questions um, come up in the exam as well. Um, as always, the book is your Bible for this exam. It's very important that you read that um, cover to cover at least once before you go into the exam. Um, I can really, I can't tell you everything, unfortunately. Um, I can only tell you the key concepts and I have no idea what they're gonna ask you about. Uh, Martin is hoping in January. So and Christmas of studying for you then, Martin. <laughs> um, or maybe a little break before you do your exam. Okay, um, I'll presume that you can all see my screen because I am sharing it. If you can't, please let me know. Uh, but hopefully that should all be working. So the first thing that we'll look at is why we need insurance, just for a little bit of um, sort of context. So why do we have insurance? So we have insurance so that we're not going to be out of pocket if something bad happens. Um, and insurance is called a risk transfer mechanism. That's what we call it. That's the process of transferring a risk from us to an insurer, okay? And the benefits of insurance are that it brings peace of mind to us, brings peace of mind to businesses as well. Um, and those are sort of economic benefits as well. So if a business is faced with a loss, say they have a big fire, for example, um, they're able to rebuild the property, they're able to still pay their wages, Things don't have to just stop because something bad has happened. Insurance allows businesses to sort of carry on. So in the insurance market, there's a number of different ways that we use the word risk. It's quite interchangeable and you might hear it used in a number of different ways. So the risk could be the actual thing that we're insuring. It could be the risks associated with the thing that we're insuring. But generally, the word risk means the possibility of an unfortunate occurrence. If there's any doubt concerning the outcome of a situation, unpredictability, um, a chance of a loss. But sometimes risk can also be the chance of a gain as well. Okay. When we consider risk, an insurer or an underwriter is, is going to look at all the different components. Um, so they're going to think about what is it that could occur? So is it theft? Is it fire? Um, so, you know, looking at the perils and the hazards, um, what's the probability that it will occur? And um, what's the likelihood? And what's the impact if it does happen? What are the consequences? So insurers are going to look at something also called the frequency and the severity of the risk. So, for example, um, I was I parked my car in Aldi last week and I came out and there was a dent in the back of my car from a trolley. These type of accidents are high frequency. So these happen all the time, but low severity because they're not. They're not impactful, they don't cost that much money. So high frequency, low severity is an example of that. And we can categorize risks in insurance as well. So just moving on to this categories section here. So firstly, we've got um, financial and non-financial risks. 
So the first financial risk is insurable. And for something to be insurable, it has to be measurable in financial terms. So things like um, damage, property damage or theft, we can measure that financially. We know how much it's going to cost to put that thing or person back in the same financial position that they enjoyed before, which is indemnity. But then on the other side of that, we have non-financial. Um, that is what it says on the tin, basically, is where the outcome of that situation, we can't measure this financially. So this could be um, somebody claiming for loss of enjoyment of a holiday. You know, we can't claim for that because how do we measure that in, in monetary terms? We don't know how much that costs to somebody. So that's like a non-financial risk. We've also got pure and speculative risks. So a pure risk is the insurable part. This is, these are typically our insurable risks. It's where there's only a chance of a loss, but not a gain. The best that we can achieve, best possible outcome is a break even situation. So when I get in my car and drive to, the, to, to, to Aldi, for example, the best that can happen is that I get there in one piece. But I could have an accident and have a loss, okay? And then finally, we've got particular and fundamental. So a particular risk is insurable because it's localized in its cause and effect. It only affects a certain area. So um, like a car crash, for example, um, it only damages certain vehicles and there's only certain people involved. It doesn't affect sort of a widespread area. It's very localized. And the opposite, the opposite of that is the uh, fundamental risks. So fundamental risks are uninsurable because they're very widespread. They're outside of anyone's control. So this is where risks arise from social, economic, political, or natural causes like war. Um, famine, earthquake, things like that. They're quite widespread. So fundamental is the non-insurable. To fund it would be mental. That's how I always remembered it. And then particular is the localized. So the basic principle of insurance is that the losses of the few, so the very few people that claim, are met by the contributions of the many. Um, which is called the pooling of risk. So we all pay our premiums um, into the common pool. That's what it's called. I think of like a pool full of money. We put all our premiums in there and any claims that come in will be taken out of that pool and paid to the claimants. However, those premiums that come in to the pool, we have to make sure that they are all equitable. So they have to be a fair presentation of the risk that that person brings to the pool. So for example, someone with a bad driving record will put more into the pool than somebody with a good driving record. They'll put in less because the person with the bad driving record is more likely to make a claim. If you do have any questions, please pop them in the chat and I can cover them um, at the end. So um, chapter one also looks at risk management. So um, commercial businesses, even insurance companies and brokers themselves may want to manage their risks. They will look at trying to reduce the potential losses uh, by managing the hazards. And um, that can give shareholders confidence. Um, it also helps companies to reduce their um, insurance as well. Risk identification involves identifying the threats that exist and the ones that might exist in the future. So not all of them are going to be insured, but they still should be managed. The risks will then be analysed. So risk managers will look at past data to analyse those risks. And they'll look at what patterns have been formed, which is going to help them in turn predict what's likely to happen in the future. And then finally, if a risk is, is deemed risky enough, there should be something put in place to try and sort of control that risk. 
um, and reduce the likelihood of it happening or even eliminate it entirely. So this could be through um, a physical measure. So installing an alarm or putting a lock on a door, or it could be a financial measure, which is the purchase of, of insurance. 